or reputed to be it for his ontological argument for the existence of God, which is found in both monologion and proslogion. And we're going to be talking, we're going to read a fair amount of, of his works because they're short, they're very accessible, and um, and, and we're going to I'm going to we're going to try to connect them with some of the earlier works that we've read read thus far. But before I do, but before we get into Anselm proper and his monologian, I want to give you a sense of where we are in history and who brought that to Anselm because this is this is a very difficult and in some sense seminal period of history. So who's heard of the Vikings? Everybody, of course, right? Like the Vikings, they're they're traveling around. They're they're barbarians. They're they're looting. They're pillaging, and essentially, after the fall of the Roman Empire, um, there's a huge amount of political chaos. And one of the only places that you could find uh, good, like you could find learning, you could find books, or you could find anything like that, would be the monasteries. And the monasteries would be the place where people were continuing to write and copy manuscripts. You remember, books have to be written out by hand in order to preserve them. And monasteries are habitually hiding their treasures, hiding their books, hiding everything, because they never know who's going to come along and take them. But it's not fun. It's only fun for a short period of time being a Viking. You know, you, you, traveling life, I mean, you get the best women, and you get get the best treasures, but what's treasure if you can't spend it, right? And what's treasure if you don't have political stability? So the Norman, the Vikings decide to reconfigure themselves as the Norman people, and they use the educated sons of their find in monasteries and in churches the <coughs> to reconfigure themselves as a kingdom. So the Normans are going to have certain major bases of operation in France, is what we would normally consider Normandy. They're going to take over southern Italy for a while, and the Lombards are going to try to fight them, but they're going to have an established kingdom there. And then if you've heard of 1066 and all of that, they're going to conquer England. Right? So, so the, the, the Normans are going to establish themselves as rulers. They're going to institute one of the biggest taxation schemes since the Roman Empire, and they're going to educate themselves, and they're going to use the, they're going to continually fund the monasteries or help them to do this. And so, so although they're conquerors, they do bring this certain sense of political stability to the world. So right now, Anselm is, is in the 11th, mid 11th century, and there's starting to be a certain amount of political which is going to enable uh, the rise of schools, it's going to enable the rise of universities. There's a, there's a, a brief period during the Carolingian Empire where there's a, a revival of classical learning, but for the most part, it's in chaos. But one of the ways in which in schools and are starting to begin is in monasteries and in cathedral schools, and one of the biggest Cathedral schools in the 11th century is going to be back in the south of France. And Lanfranc of Beck is going to be the major teacher at that time period. And Lanfranc is going to be teaching dialectic, which is essentially logic and theology. And he is going to he's going to draw people from all over Europe, from England, from Italy, from Germany, from everywhere. They're all going to come to the south of France, to this monastery, to this cathedral, <coughs> and take classes from Lanfranc. And they're, they're a bit in awe, too, because Lanfranc is in the midst of a big controversy about transubstantiation. And this is actually the first time that the accidents and substance um, get applied to the Eucharist. And so if you're interested in the Eucharistic controversy, Lanfranc and his battle with Berengar is the place to go. I'm not going to talk about that. But Lanfranc is a really powerful, interesting figure, and then he's going to go off and become a <coughs> The reason he's important is that Anselm um, is about 23, living in what we would consider North of Italy, but at that time it was Burgundia, and he decides, I'm just going to wander. I'm going to take a walk about, right, for three years. We don't know why he decides to do this, but I mean, why do 23-year-old decide to just see the world? 
because it's there, right? So he's, he's just wandering the world, and he finds Beck. And he finds the word in Beck. And he's, he's excited about logic. He's excited about um, learning. And he decides he's going to become a Benedictine monk and study with Lanfranc and stay there. Because, you know, Benedictine monks, they take this vow of civility. So he's going to stay in Beck and read and write and teach perhaps one day. And and so he, as his, he as he he's learning in the Lanfranc, but you know a lot there's this whole controversy over the Eucharist. But then Lanfranc leaves to become Archbishop of Canterbury, and it, and so you know when, when the teacher leaves, the main teaching leaves, it leaves room for new lights. And Anselm decides that he's going to take a study of theology in at the end of the 11th century in a new direction. He's going to focus it, revive the study of what it makes of natural theology. What is it that can be known by natural reason about God? A Trinitarian theology. Is it possible to know the Trinity by natural reason? Of questions of predestination and foreknowledge and free will. He's, he's, he's going, this is going to be his new program of theological inquiry and philosophical inquiry. And so this and, and so he's going to apply and get that this is great. If you look at all of the works of Anselm, they can have they they parallel works of Augustine. <clears throat> if you can you can find a parallel work of Augustine. But the thing that this differentiates Anselm from Augustine is Anselm loves logic. And so he's gonna do like Boethius does and he's gonna take all these works of Anselm and he's gonna Aristotelian logic then, right? And he's gonna he's gonna be the next he, he seems to be configuring himself as the next Boethius. And this is really significant in part because at this time most philosophy and most theology is done in commentary form. And Anselm decides he's gonna write treatises again. So here's a man who's taking who breathes Augustine, seems to breathe Boethius, who's translating in some senses, Augustinian philosophy and theology into logical terms. And this is actually one of the reasons why he and he and he's made this decision that although and with most medieval thinkers you'll find a lot of shoring up of authorities. Well Augustine says this and so and so says that and Gregory says this. But with Anselm, he wants his logic to speak for himself. He wants to make the argument work. And if the argument works without some sort of appeal to authority, that's what he wants. That's, that's his goal. And it actually makes it really nice if you're, if you're not acquainted with medieval philosophy or theology because you can just read it. And you can take the argument as it is. And you don't have to necessarily know everything that came before because you're not constantly quoting other people. Which is nice because once we get to Thomas Aquinas and a lot of these other writers, they're, they're going to constantly authority and then try to logically work with it. But the Anselm, straightforward, here's the argument. But don't think of it. Just because he puts the argument first doesn't mean that he's not fully engaged in the tradition that we've been dealing with so far, right? He is really engaged. Have a question? Well, it seems that in many ways Anselm has fallen out of favor even though Aquinas is still very heavily used. Mm-hmm. Why is this? Is it because of this seeming lack of appeal to tradition? I think that's, a, that's definitely a possibility. I think Aquinas is, there are historical reasons for us we can get into, not least of which is Aquinas experience because of revival at the end of the 19th century and the 20th century. And also Anselm has a tendency Anselm has a Platonic metaphysic, and Aquinas has a Platonic Aristotelian metaphysic. And that's going, just because he's using logic doesn't mean that Anselm's not using Platonism. And Platonism falls in and out of favor in various points of history. But that's a good question. And there's probably more I can say about that. Any other comments, questions? What were, what was, any initial responses to the Monologion? How did you find it? Did you find it to be straightforward? Did you read it and say, <coughs> what do you think? <coughs> okay, good. It's, it's closer to what we consider to be 
um, philosophy um, and in the way it's organized. Uh, any other thoughts? It kind of reminded me of the way that Socrates are used. Okay, how so? Um, it was just like using a bunch of analogies um, and almost arguing another point um, and then going back to the original point and saying, like, well, because this was true, this was not true. Um, and and it just, it, it's almost kind of like deceptive arguing for me. Um, and Socrates is like, I'm always kind of skeptic to like follow it just because he's such a good deceptive manipulator. Arguer, and I just, so I'm kind of. Like, I'm yeah, I, I think it's interesting that you say that because, because first, of all, <coughs> the only Plato, straight up Plato, that Anselm's going to have, even though I say he's got a, a plot metaphysics, is going to be the Timaeus, and even then, but he's getting a lot of his Plato from Boethius, and yet he writes um, <coughs> not in the Monologion, but in a few other dialogues, he writes dialogues kind of like Plato. So he. He imitates Plato's style a lot, and I think you're right, there's a, there's a sense in which, okay, you're following this argument along, it looks really clear, can I trust you, Anselm? And, and so it's, it's helpful, too, to know the tradition so that you can see what structures are underlying the argument. Um, one other thing, so I'd like to just briefly, what does what Anselm say is at the beginning in the preface, in the purpose, right? Which is basically, oh, well, Hattie wasn't going to write a lot of poetry. In the Middle Ages, people don't want to set themselves up for the authorities, even when they are setting themselves up for the authorities. It's just, I wasn't going to write this, but all of my brothers really wanted it. So here it is, a little meager offering that it is, and you can take it or leave it. And, and you'll notice also, he says, and there's nothing in here that you probably can't find in Augustine, especially the end of the church fathers, especially the ancient um, and he's going to do this because we have letters, we have lots of letters from Anselm, and there does seem to have been a certain outcry about this work that where people were like, "Whoa, Anselm, are you taking us away from the church tradition?" He's like, "No, I just haven't cited him. Just because I haven't cited the church fathers doesn't mean that they're not there." Um, so, but he, but you'll notice he points out. His goal is to write something that is simple and straightforward and has no appeal to scripture in the monologion. This is why I said the monologion is more philosophical, whereas the proslogion is going to be more, um, more theological, because the proslogion appeals to scripture, constantly appeals to scripture. The monologion is designed, you'll notice he uses the Greek title, monologion, proslogion, because that's a bad, basically means it's going to make one long argument, one long string of an argument. The pro slogan is supposed to be one single argument that's pro, that's uh, some sort of kind of prayer to God. This is designed to be kind of an interwoven strand of arguments. And, um, and it's no, no citation of authority. And if you follow it, and now that you've read Boethius, and now that we've, we've talked about it, you will find that he basically. The outline of Monologion follows a certain pattern. He he asks, what is, what is it to be the best, greatest being slash nature? Um, and and then he's going to talk about how can we predication of this being. That is, how do we talk about this being? Predication is just the way. And so he's going to use the category. And he's going to use similar sorts of things, but he doesn't use the intrinsic and extrinsic distinction uh, explicitly. He follows what the way he does with the extra. So he's going to talk about substantial present predication. There's been a lot of time of place and time, which is the reason why I get excited about monologion because I'm interested in eternity. And then other accidents, how they don't apply to God because they apply change and manipulation. Today <coughs> we're only going to get as far as place and time and other accidents, and then next on Friday we'll deal with the Trinity. So we didn't take some time to fin finish the monologion, finish the part about the Trinity and the end of the monologion and get, get to our, on the Incarnation, which is actually, I think we should go. Okay, so what kind of, how does this argument, how does Anselm unfold this argument? 
um, living in the low yacht. He's, and where is he getting this from? The end. I'd like to read to you uh, a quote from Rui Pinka's Constellation of Philosophy because I think I think you will find it's very similar. It uses very similar language to Anselm because Anselm is going to define God as that in which the greater being can be thought. And so Boethius says that God, the principle of all things, the, the first cause of all things, is good, is proved by the common concept of all men's minds. For since nothing better than God can be conceived of, who can doubt that that, that which no, nothing but is better, is good? But reason so much shows that God is good, that it proves clearly that perfect good also is in him. For unless he were such, he could not be the principle that is the first cause of all things, for there would be something possessing perfect good more excellent than he, which in this world would seem to be prior and more ancient. For it has become clear that all perfect things are prior to the less perfect. Therefore, so that our argument does not fall into an infinite regress, we must admit that the most high God is full of the most high and perfect good. But we, but we have decided that the perfect good is true happiness. Therefore, true happiness must reside in I read that to you because Anselm doesn't have Plato's Republic, but Boethius has Plato's Republic. And this is a summary of that 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 argument in the Republic, the very end, where he argues there are multiple good things in the world, and they can either be caused by themselves or by something else. And Plato argues multiple good things imply that one good thing caused these multiple good things. And this is how Plato argues through the voice of Socrates for there being one God. Boethius is going to do that. Anselm's going to do the same thing. He's at the very beginning, he, he, he says, he, he writes that, okay, say you have, you have ne if you're a pure man who has never heard of the Christian truth, you've never heard of scripture, you've never heard of anything like this. And remember, Vikings are pretty newly converted. It's not like he's, Anselm's is a single bastion, it's just a complete Christian insularity. Uh, he says, it would be possible for such a man to come to a knowledge of God who was the highest good. Because he would look at all of the goods in the world and conclude that they must have a cause. And by doing so, he could, get, could conclude that this cause would be the highest good. And using a similar sort of reasoning, he could see that there are, that there are greater things and lesser things in world and that if there something that there might be a cause that is the greatest of all things that makes things that are greater and lesser and thus since both of these are one causes and there can only be there can be only one right you've got the highest good equals the highest the greatest possible being and from this he's going to going to argue he's going to to set up an argument for uh, there being for the first for the perfect good being the the first cause of all things, and so and so he's going to think about and this is going to be he, again he might have had it today as but he also has a he's talking about the things. Okay, if God is the first cause of all things. How would this? He's thinking. How would this person understand the first cause of all things operate? Well, and you'll remember this this kind of craftsman analogy that we've been talking about all along. Most of the time, when we think about craftsmen and the creation of things, we think about there being three things: a craftsman or an artisan, a form or a blueprint, and matter. And yet. If you're thinking logically, what could the world be made out of? What matter would the highest good create the world out of if he's the first cause of all things? And he gives three <coughs> options. The matter could either be, he could either create it from himself, he could create it from something else, or he could create it from nothing. So, why, 
does anyone remember why he says he couldn't create it from himself? What's the problem? Go ahead. Because the, um, A has to be different from B. If, if A is created, or if B is created out of A, then the, the, B, the supreme being couldn't divide himself. This is also why he argues that he, uh, he has no getting get your head because he can't be outside of himself. Okay, good. So we have a, a supreme being, as Plato said, has to be unchangeable, right? And a supreme being being unchangeable, if he made things from himself, what would that imply? <coughs> that would imply some sort of change. It would imply taking, changing his, his own nature and making it into something else. That would make this highest good a less good because it would be changeable in some way. So can, how can you make it from something else? Can, can this high school make, make the world from something else? Why not? Why not? Uh, well, we have to say this is a part, but I don't know, I guess like something existing besides God. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, it, 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 and this is proof of Anselm's point. Like, if you think about things logically, what are, what are my options? My options are from something else, from my, from itself, from nothing. If it's something else, then there's some other highest good. Because that means it, there can be only one, remember? There can be only one. So that's impossible. Therefore, it must be from nothing. And so, Anselm seems to think that if you have this concept of God based upon an idea that goods are caused by one good and that there's one greatest possible nature, then you can have a concept of God as a creator from nothing, which, ding, 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 is the Christian concept of God. So even though many of the early philosophers did not have, seem to have a concept of God that implied creation from some pre-existent matter, they're not being logical. <coughs> because there are only three options, and two options are invalid, so therefore they're not being, being logical. Okay. Made it from another being, or made it from... Right. Yeah. Because where is it? Where did this other being come from? Um, if it's for this one first thing, supposed to be the cause of all things. So, so you see, he's, he's kind of he's regurgitating Anselm's argument, but not, I mean, his argument, Socrates' argument from the Republic, but he's making it um, basically lead logically to creation of a God who's a creator of all things from nothing, which is the Christian concept. Of God, so in some ways he's like Paul. This, if you believe in a greatest good, who's the greatest God? He have if, if, he, if you believe in that, you have to believe in a creator who makes all things from nothing. He's the Christian God. <coughs> Mesh. Okay, if we've got this kind of <coughs> of being being the first cause of all things, how are we supposed to speak about him? And so he goes through and asks that what. What must be the case about this kind of, of, of being that, that would cause us to be able to speak about him in some ways, but not other ways? Remember, this is the question that Augustine was dealing with when he was talking to the Arians, and that Boethius was dealing with his parents, on, on the Trinity. And what was, if you remember, the problem, what causes Aristotle's ten categories to not operate quite normally when we're dealing with a being like he just described. Okay, so we've got first we've got the whole Trinity thing, which is which is different, and so there's clearly something happening here. So there's a relation. But, but, but that's it. So that's one of the examples of where logic seems to be not operating. How do you have three and one, right? Um, and the categorical logic is based on that, Jacqueline. Um, all the categories have to be applied substantially to God because his primary and secondary substance have to be 
the same or identical. Okay, good. So God's primary, if, if we have to think about how, how substantive and accidental predication work with respect to God because God's primary substance is equal to a secondary substance. What's a primary substance? An individual, good. Secondary substance. Class and Yes. So Socrates is an individual substance. Human is a secondary substance. Humanity. Socrates participates in the quality in, in the quality of humanity, the substance of humanity. But you'll notice the participation relationship is one of hierarchy, where one thing has some sort of cause causing of another thing. But if God, if if we use this logic and we don't want an infinite regress <coughs> that multiple goods must be caused by one good. We can't have that one good be caused by some other property. You'll notice that Anselm is not a Kantian. It's not like you have all of these different kinds of concepts. Justice. Justice is not some sort of thing by which you can measure God. God is justice. You don't measure God by something outside of him because everything that exists, including ideas and concepts and forms, are all caused by him. Not just the physical world, the intelligible world, too. So you have, and so this is going to, because the categories, the ten categories, presume you have a primary, secondary substance separation, we're going to have to, we've had to modify them. Somewhat, just like with Euclidean geometry, when you challenge certain major axioms of, of Euclid, the way the geometry works is going to change. So, what kinds of things are we going to say are substantially predicated of God? What? So we've got secondary substance is substantially predicated of God. What other two qualities were the ones that Augustine identifies as being substantial when we talk about God? Two categories. The intrinsic categories. Okay, yes, the intrinsic categories. And so the intrinsic categories are going to be substance, quality, and quantity. So, quality when applied to God, what would be a quality of God? Goodness. Goodness. What would be, would be a quantity of God? Hmm? One. Good. What else would be a quantity of God? Three. Um, what else? Infinite goodness or maximum. Infinite, right. And this is the primary substantial quantity of God. Is this kind of infinite maximum nature. <coughs> and Anselm's going to add to this by saying there are two ways to conceive of what it means to be highest or maximum. One is highest comparatively. So God's quantity is such that, I mean, he's not he's going to be better than his creation. But he's also going to have, uh, there, you can also be better um, quantitatively, absolutely, so relatively and absolutely. Absolutely speaking, God is better, because is the greatest because of who he is, and there's no comparison. And this is going to be one of the reasons why it's hard to speak about him, because there is no comparison. There's a way in which there is only one kind of being whose being is equal to his nature. Because what, like we said, to Anselm's argument is going to be 
because Anselm is going to have his arguments going to follow. Okay, there's a great, the greatest possible being is God. Existence is an attribute of the greatest possible being, therefore God exists. One of the first responders to this argument is going to be Gavinilio, who's going to be, which is basically, actually, Gavinilio is probably not his name, Gavinilio just means fool. So he's like, I'm the fool you're talking about, and I just don't get it, Anselm, so gotta explain it to me. So he's gonna be really flippant and he's going to write this letter to Anselm. He's like, I can imagine the best possible island, the best possible island, but with one attribute, he doesn't, it doesn't exist. And Anselm's gonna come back and we're gonna read this, and he's gonna say, Islands are four matter composites. Their nature is not equal to their being, and by their very nature, they are not the greatest of, uh, of, of beings or natures. Islands just exist. They don't have to be the greatest of possible beings, whereas God, in his very nature, has to be the greatest of possible natures in order to even be God. So this is going to be the, the basis of his, uh, the foundation of his argument. But you'll notice, and, and I think I'm glad you brought this up, this is where I'd like, if, I, I've had on the board on the of argument question mark. The reason that Anselm's assigned this, it, so there are multiple arguments for the existence of God, and a lot of people can categorize by Aquinas when we talk about that, in some sense, when we talk about five ways. And one of the things that happens when you take an argument and just pull it out of context, is we often it, it can actually lead it to not being to not being as stable as as it was in its context. So this ontological argument um, is often compared to a teleological argument, which basically says things appear to have an end towards which they're going. Um, you need to have an author of such an end, or the first cause argument, um, which could either be that one good can cause all goods, or the kind of argument from creation, which is another kind of first argument that says, cause argument that says there's a necessary being that causes contingent beings. But as you'll notice, the way I've articulated Anselm in the beginning of Longokion is he's basing his argument for the greatest possible being is God upon this belief that there's a first cause. And that someone who is looking at um, the world and trying to argue are, thinks first about the fact that there must be a first cause and what must be the nature of that first cause. And then he can move on to something like the ontological argument. And so Anselm's ontological argument really does not function if you don't have an argument from the first cause first. It just, it doesn't work. I mean, what, 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 upon what basis do you say that God is the greatest possible being and that existence is an attribute of the greatest possible being if you don't have some sort of argument that's for why God can be the greatest possible being first? You don't have any basis for that. Um, and so, but once you have a basis for that, Anselm's going to say, look, we can make this neat little argument here that says, Existence is an attribute of the various possible being, therefore, God exists. Okay. One of the problems I found with Anselm is the time that it's, and for a modern reader, he takes a lot of shortcuts and dismisses a lot of. Okay, for example, he says, we could never, after all of this work, just think that something could be created out of nothing that's more than an intellect. But in modern philosophy, there is no thought that says eventually everything that exists will not exist, and that's what we find. And so it's, it's very hard for the modern body to accept a priori that there has to be something. And I, and I think that this is one of the reasons why Anselm can sometimes fall out of favor, too, because you're like, well, wait a minute, Anselm, we think that everything came from nothing. But you can also ask yourself, to use, and this is where using old books can cause us to challenge our assumptions. Upon what basis do we think everything can come from nothing? Philosophically, upon what basis do we think everything can 
And that's going to be something that Anselm will press you on. But, but of course, you don't have as many people arguing for that, for that position. Well, everything came from nothing. But now you know. But one of the things that Anselm does, even if you, you say, no, Anselm, things can come from nothing, and that's what we believe, is Anselm does lay out the possibilities. A, B, C. Those are the ones. Um, so, so basically, so any other comments or questions before we go on? Because basically, he's going to say, like Anselm, I'm going to get that no other accidents can exist in God because accidents require change. A place and time and relation, we have to think very carefully about. So today I'm going to finish talking about place and time and then tomorrow relation. Question? I'll just ask why we don't um, uh, include the first counseling in the I think part of it is, is the ways in which we how do I put this? Part of it is that a who lays out the five ways, which is really easy to remember. Let's, let's face it, Anselm's argument, like you said, it feels like you're he's leading you down a purpose path. He's got a chain after a chain after a chain after a chain. Philosophers don't like chains of arguments, they like simple arguments, and Aquinas is very good at saying these are the five arguments. And the nice, the nice thing about it is it's easy to remember. Like there's a way in which, okay, premise, premise, conclusion. But if you read in context, you realize a lot of these arguments aren't just separate arguments, they work together. The second reason I think we typically don't, we don't do this is there's a general, there can be a general suspicion of metaphysical causation. And Anselm, that's definitely a premise he assumes, along with Plato, that goods must be caused by a good. That a mind, if you see order, there must be a mind that creates that order. That's just a premise he has. And if you don't agree with that premise, you're not going to agree with this conclusion. Good. Any other thoughts, comments? Okay, last bit, place and time. So place and time are two categories that are somewhat related, related. even though they don't have this concept of three dimension, three dimension, four dimensions, there are ways in which Aristotle considers these things to be related, and, and we today consider, well, place and time are related things. And you'll remember when we did Augustine's Confession that the fact that human minds are rooted in, in kind of spatial reasoning and temporal reasoning is one of the intellectual challenges for human beings to come to know God at all. Because there's a way in which God is not spatial and he's not temporal. And we, as our minds, are used to spatial and temporal beings. And so even if we didn't have the sin and the problem of the two wills that we find in Paul, we still have the problem that our minds are adequate and expect a spatial, temporal being, and God is neither one of those things. But there are arguments, and Anselm breaks them down for us, for why the greatest good might be this kind, might be an atemporal being, that you can make, based upon this idea, this logic, that God must be the greatest of possible things. And you can use these arguments then, this concept, this argument for essentially God being eternal, uh, to then apply to, to think about how God might, might be everywhere, exist in place and time, or not exist in place and time. He makes two arguments. One is based upon an argument found in Augustine's um, De Trinitate, where he, he may, Augustine talks about the same sort of thing they translate God's being, is a component of his nature, is a component of his life. All of these things are substantive, um, substantive pred predications. But because they're all substantive predications, what that means is, Augustine says, you can argue from a, an attribute or a cluster of attributes to another attribute. So, Plato thought that the greatest possible good has to be unchanging. Most people would agree that the greatest possible good would need to be without beginning. Most people would agree that the greatest possible good would need to be without an end, with three attributes, 
being unchangeable without beginning and without end is essentially what we mean when we talk about eternity. Therefore, God is eternity. God is not just eternal. God is eternity. This is one of the biggest problems I find in a lot of liter modern literature on eternity, is it tends to try to make eternity, like Brian Lefthal's book tends to do this, eternity some sort of space that God inhabits, but as we talk about God doesn't inhabit a space, for Anselm, God's eternity equals his, his being in nature. And, and this is particularly important because a lot of modern philosophy, when they talk about atemporal and temporal concepts of eternity, look to two main historical figures to argue that, Anselm and Schleiermacher. So you have to get Anselm right, because Anselm is the paradigmatic espouser of atemporal eternity. So that's the first argument that basically Boethius cleans up and says, immutable, <coughs> Without beginning, without end, basically cleans up Augustine's language, but leaves the argument intact. But then he does, he tries to find a simpler argument for God being eternal. And it's based upon this idea that God is true. Remember, the second person of the Trinity is often called the truth. But fundamentally, substantially, God is true. And modern philosophers today will often say, that if eternal things exist, they're probably things like mathematical truths, right? One plus one equals two. There's no beginning to end at which one plus one starts to equal two, and there's no end. This is an unchanging thing. There's no beginning, there's no end, it doesn't change, it just is. So the idea for modern philosophy, philosophers, a lot of them, that truth would be eternal is, okay, that's possible. The idea that, but that extra step, the reason why Anselm is able to make this extra step, and it's based upon an argument in Augustine's soliloquies, which is very deep for you, but it's probably one of his more philosophical, um, honestly, more platonic, like dialogue-oriented works, and probably where Anselm gets that, that genre of work, is this basis that if God is truth, and truth is eternal, therefore, God is eternal, because he's truth. And this is gonna have some really interesting um, implications, because, and, and we can talk about how that's, this works in some of his later works, because he has a work on truth, and you can look at some of the more, he works out um, what he means by truth, and that there are different levels of truth in his work on truth. I think you might read that. Or not? That's too bad. Um, but what do we mean by truth? Does that mean historical truths are eternally true? That God's knowledge of even history is eternal? This is going to be a question Anselm deals with. It's going to be something that makes a lot of modern philosophy uncomfortable because most of us are not comfortable with history being eternally true. I mean, Boethius might have been, and certain Platonists and Stoics might have been, because there's this concept of fate. But basically, everything that's going to happen, the major things are kind of written in the stars somewhere. But for modern people, we want to, we're concerned about the concern, freedom of the will. So, to so the, the the basic argument, God is true. Etern truth is eternal, therefore God is eternal, <laughs> because God is his attributes. That's going to be the argument. How does such a being exist in place and time? Go ahead. You said there's some argument about history not being true? History not being true in the eternal sense. So it's much, it's pretty easy for us to comprehend, okay, one plus one equals two eternally without beginning, without end, without change. Yeah. How, how, but understanding history as, when, when we mean the flow of time and human events, as unchangeably true without beginning and end is hard, is not necessarily. Well, I mean, sure. what's already happened will have happened for all eternity. Yes, so we can think of it as a, as a mitigated eternity without, without end. But it still doesn't get us to the absolute eternity of without beginning. I mean, like, 
eternity can only go into the future and what's happened in the past is already established regardless of what happens in the future. Right, which would allow it to have, since, it, which, since things have happened and they're not set, we can say from our perspective, and some of this depends upon your models of time, but we can say the past is set, the past is unchangeable, assuming there's no time travel. Probably, yeah, probably the most accurate book for that sort of thing, not book, movie, would be Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. <laughs> um, and, but but that it's set, that means that there's no end to that set, it's unchangeableness. But that changeableness, theoretically, if you don't believe the future is just written in stone, is not set. And so it would be like eternity in two ways, but not the other way. Yeah, but there's no way in which what happens in the future can be history until it happens. From God's perspective, from Anselm's perspective, he would consider that history. The whole thing. Oh. The whole oh. Th That's a good question. That the whole damage of human experience. It's history. It's one long story, and God has it all in time, all at one time. <clears throat> and so, in the last five minutes, this kind of being, how can he exist in place and time? And, and there's kind of a parallel between how we can understand him existing in place and time. On the one hand, a God that doesn't exist everywhere is not, doesn't seem to be perfect. And yet, when something exists everywhere, it would appear that there are kind of limitations in existing everywhere, because most, most of the time, if we think of something existing everywhere, this would mean it would be divisible into parts, because place and time have certain kind of rules and laws that dictate that if you are in one place and you are in another place, the only way I can be extending from this part of the floor to this part of the floor is one part of me is here and another part of me is there. But the idea that God is in parts, or has his presence in parts, is problematic because it does not appear to be the greatest thing. So what we want is a concept of God as being everywhere, but everywhere as a whole. And in every time, as his whole being. Because God is simple. When people think about um, and I think modern philosophy often misconstrues this when they think about the Middle Ages. When they say God is simple, the divine simplicity, all they mean is God's being equals his nature. That's all the simplicity means. If you try to add that more, add more to that, you're going to run into difficulty. It's going to be philosophically un 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 unsustainable. But somehow the, the wholeness of God's being in nature can be in one place and, and time in another place in time. All of them. And so what, what Anselm is going to say is this is clearly a perfection for God to be in every place, in, in, in place and time. It's clearly a perfection that he has to remain whole. Therefore, what is our only option? <clears throat> Basically, the God is in every place and time as a whole, but without being limited to the rules and laws of place and time. There's some, and, and so this can be articulated in different ways, maybe this is a form of knowledge, presence, but it's a kind of presence that is in every place and time, and yet it's in some sense in no place and time, because being in a place and time requires being limited to the rules and laws of place and time. So that's going to be his conclusion. And then he's going to, to summarize this all up, and I'll, I'll end this with you with this, um, by quoting Boethius' Constellation of Philosophy. What then is eternity but the illimit illimitable life that is life without beginning and end, possessed all at one time, simultaneously? And so basically what... Boy, it, Anselm feels like he's done this. He's, he's made an argument based upon Augustine, based upon making logical priorities, logical um, categories for Boethius' definition. So, are there any comments or questions in the last two minutes? It's a lot, it's mind blowing. But next time we'll do the Trinity, which is even more mind blowing. <laughs>